Dear members of AJC community, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to be among friends and address the AJC Global Forum, a platform that brings together leaders and visionaries committed to fostering understanding, tolerance, and cooperation among nations. No one knows better than Jews the tragic price that humanity pays if these values are trampled. If in the hour of need, the ideals of liberty and democracy are not defended. If silence or neutrality prevails in the face of aggression. The most distressing of all is the understanding that humanity has to relearn these lessons again and again. We have witnessed too many times how unaccountable non-democratic regimes and unchecked human right abuses inside autocracies will eventually spill over across the borders in the form of aggression. Again, Israel knows it too well. Just some time ago in Europe, we might have dreamt that war of aggression is a tragic relic of the past. Yet nothing shook the global security and rule-based international order more than ruthless and premeditated war that Russia unleashed against Ukraine. This merciless war is posing the gravest threat to the peace and security in Europe, and I have no doubt to the entire world. It would be no exaggeration to say that Russia's war can be viewed as grave defeat of humanity. Every, I stress every, hope for common sense and human decency was crushed by the cruelty of Russian army the rape of minors and the elders, tearing children apart from their families and deporting them to Russia, torturing civilians in occupied Ukrainian territory, shelling and occupying the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, threatening the world with nuclear rhetoric, destroying the dam of Nova Kachovka and turning water into weapon. These are not scenes from the horror movie. These are the daily realities of Russia's occupation in Ukraine. Russian world, as they call it, Ruski Mir, in action. Indeed, Putin is waging a genocidal war against Ukrainian nation. Putin's regime aims to annihilate the whole nation just because they have a distinct Ukrainian identity and are keen to live in democracy. But Putin's raw hate for democracy combined with Russia's military cooperation with the regime's in North Korea and Iran, Russia's colonial-like policies in Africa, Russia's weaponization of information, food, energy, water. These are just a few examples how Russia's imperial ambitions pose a danger far beyond Ukrainian borders. On the other hand, this brutal war cemented the unity of like-minded partners across the world. Europe, NATO, the whole democratic world has never been more united, and we must uphold this unity as this war is an assault against the freedom, democracy, and rule of law. Today, <laughs> today, the first line of global defense of liberty and democracy lies in Ukraine. To end this war sooner, we, the community of democratic nations, urgently need to give Ukraine all the weapons it needs. Every delayed day costs human lives, including the lives of innocent civilians. As we work towards establishing the sustainable peace, we need to be very clear that future peace shall be defi defined by Ukraine, not the aggressor. Indeed, any peace formula must include justice. Only full accountability that reaches even the highest ranking leaders involved can serve justice to the victims and help to break the horrible cycle of Russia's war in the future. I believe that Israel's experience in seeking justice and historical truth is now of crucial importance to Ukraine, and your advice will certainly be valuable in the future. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the past year, during this brutal war, we have witnessed not only unprecedented unity of democracies, but also a growing alliance between Russia and Iran. Both pushed themselves to the status of outcasts 
and fully share the we against the decadent West worldview. Unfortunately, the status is also mutually beneficial to them. Russia gets access to Iran's weapon supply and Iran at the same time a cover for advancing its nuclear program and inflaming regional instability. We are witnessing the spread of threats to the security of the democratic world. In this context, my country has done much more than just usual public condemnation. In recent months, at least five Iranian drone companies were sanctioned by EU on our initiative. Russia's 10th sanction package widens export ban to Russia of goods used as drone components, includes export ban of dual use goods to seven Iranian companies, producers of drones, and search for a wider solution to ban export of drone components to Iran. Lithuania spearheaded additional EU sanctions on Iran and will continue to do so in the future. I want to point out that efforts should also continue in exposing Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps for their support to terror groups and expanding the use of all instruments in the EU toolbox to effectively counter such practices. <laughs> I want to reassure you, we will continue pushing for more sanctions. But at the same time, we all know that Israel's defensive systems remain the best antidote against Iranian weapons. Today, as the democratic world faces the trampling of freedom, it is even more important to maintain an international order that does not tolerate the threats and use of aggression against sovereign states. The Ukrainian struggle also recalls the painful history of our peoples. Lithuania and Israel know the price of independence better than anyone else. Our countries and our people understand that independence is a fragile gift, so we must make every effort to nurture our freedom and independence. This is crucial for the peaceful future of Europe, of entire democratic world to stay united and to help Ukraine with all the possible means. The cooperation of our countries is about our shared values. We will always be on the side of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. It is our responsibility as governments and politicians to take necessary decisions to safeguard those values. Defending tolerance and peace requires us to be firm. We have had many opportunities to see that appeasing dictators does not make them better, but only increases their aggression. Golda Meir. <laughs> Golda Meir, the famous Israeli politician said, we do not thrive on military acts. We do them because we have to. And thank God we are efficient. These words are particularly relevant today. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased that Lithuania and Israel has always been close allies and partners with a very strong historical and cultural bonds between our two nations. Our countries have shared a common struggle for freedom and independence, and we serve as a shining example of resilience in the face of adversity. We understand the importance of remaining vigilant against external threats and safeguarding our hard fought freedom. We know the significance of unity and solidarity, as well as the power of education and innovation in driving process. Despite our geographic distance, we stand together as nations that have overcome great obstacles to secure our rightful place in the world. Let me use this opportunity once again to express my sincere greetings on the 75th anniversary of the independence of the State of Israel. During these years, Israel has endured countless trials in its question of statehood. Yet, with unwavering determination, the Israeli people have built a thriving nation that serves as a beacon of democracy and progress in the region. Your contribution to science, technology, and culture are remarkable, and they continue to make strides that benefit humanity as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, this year, my hometown, Vilnius, is celebrating 700th birthday. It is about the same number of years.
It is about the same number of years the history of the Jews is counting in Lithuania. Lithuanian Jews have made a significant contribution to the formation of Lithuanian statehood over time. 700 years of rich history, hundreds if not thousands of world famous personalities, including Nobel Prize winners and internationally acclaimed artists, thinkers, scientists, doctors, and more. Some of the most renowned religious schools still bearing the names of Lithuanian towns and cities, the cities of world class religious centers that continue their legacy in the United States and Israel. And then the hundreds of theaters, literary artistic groups, schools, and synagogues that have graced our cities and towns, adding to the cultural tapestry of our communities. Lithuania can be rightfully called the untarnished diamond of Europe's Jewish cultural heritage, forged over a generation by the Jewish community in Lithuania. Today, our objective as Lithuanians is to uncover, remember, understand, and deeply value both our present cultural treasures and those that have regrettably slipped away. At the same time, we must recognize that without embracing the teachings of history, the prospect of meaningful future remains elusive. The Holocaust inflicted an indescribable trauma upon Lithuania, leaving lasting scars that persist even to this day. The loss we suffered had gone beyond the physical. It has, as a matter of fact, shattered our very sense of identity, our selfhood. The horrific events of the present also bring the tragedies of the past into focus. It is not enough to repeat never again. It is not enough to wait, hoping everything will work itself out. Failure to respond to anti-Semitism, xenophobia, homophobia is not tolerance of dissent, but rather cowardice with destructive consequences. <laughs> Another important point is that it is not enough to mourn the losses either. It is necessary to nurture, cultivate, and appreciate the seedlings that still remain. Only this way we will our words about the painful loss gain weight and wield true power. We aim to perpetuate our history, to restore respect and reverence, whether through the revision of school curriculum, the preservation of Jewish cultural heritage, or the restoration of historical justice. In addition to goodwill compensation law that was enacted in 2011, a decision was made late last year to allocate additional funds as a symbolic monetary compensation for private property, including airless property of Lithuanian Jews that was nationalized or illegally expropriated by the Nazis and Soviet totalitarian regime. <clears throat> and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the AJC for supporting the Lithuanian government in making this important decision for all of us. The law on the prohibition of the promotion of totalitarian and authoritarian regimes and their ideologies was also adopted six months ago as a democratic means to defend ourselves against ideologies that aim to destroy democracy, human compassion, and the identities of the states and peoples, as well as against any signs left by these ideologies. It allows for the removal of symbols associated with totalitarianism or authoritarianism from public spaces, including monuments and memorials, as well as renaming of streets, squares, and other public spaces. In conclusion, the bond between Lithuania and Israel is deeply anchored in our shared history, values, and our joint aspiration for a better world. Let us move forward hand in hand, building bridges, fostering Jewish life, and ensuring that the memory of the past shapes a brighter and more compassionate future for all of us. Let me express the hope that we will all continue to work closely and to provide all possible assistance to Ukraine that we will make every effort to preserve peace in our regions and that we will build a community based on commitment to fight against injustice and restrictions on human freedom. 
Thank you very much.